You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 122, Speaking Bislama and Nafsan. Hello, language lovers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. This week, we're having a conversation with Anna and Nick about Bislama and Nafsan, two languages of Vanuatu. Anna Krajinovic and Nick Teberger joined me in what I'd like to call a 360 degree episode. Me being in New York City, Anna in Germany, and Nick in Melbourne, Australia. How cool is that? In this episode, we talked about their work as linguists in the Pacific nation of Vanuatu. We learned how the Bislama language came to be named, how Bislama and Nafsan are constructed, and how they are used among the 130 languages spoken by Nivans in Vanuatu. Nick and Anna tell us about how they came to studying these languages through their fieldwork, and Anna tells us some details about the specific grammar function that she focused on for her PhD. We even learn a linguistic similarity between Nafsan and Croatian. Who knew? Along the way, we also talk about changes in Nafsan and Bislama over generations, the culture of storytelling, and concepts of self-sufficiency in Vanuatu. Thank you to Anna and Nick for sharing bits of your research and fieldwork with all of us. If you enjoy episodes of Speaking Tongues, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Speaking Tongues podcast on Apple Podcasts, and like and subscribe on YouTube so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. If you've been a longtime listener of the show or even a recent listener, you can now pledge ongoing support for the show on buymeacoffee.com or on patreon.com. For just $5 a month on Patreon, you will have access to excerpts of this conversation that did not make it to the full published episode. And as you know, I wrote a book. My Food Zine of International Language and Cuisine, Taste Buds Volume 1, is available now for purchase. Check social media for the sneak peek inside the book and make sure that you purchase one for yourself and one for your friends. Links to all platforms are in the show notes. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I'm here today with Anna and with Nick. How are you both today? Hi, very well, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm also good. Thanks for having us. <laughs> and I'm excited to talk about Vanuatu. Great, me too. And I have to tell my listeners that this is a 360 degree episode because I'm in New York, Nick, you're in Australia, and Anna, you're in Germany. So we are around the world today in this conversation. And thank you so much for getting us all coordinated and on the time that would work for all of us. And I really appreciate it. Uh, I like to start each episode with the same question, and that is, what is your first language and which languages have you learned to speak? That's to both of you. Um, okay, yeah, I guess I can start. Uh, so my native language is Croatian. Uh, and then I learned how to speak English, which you can hear. Uh, I speak quite fluently. And then Portuguese and German, I also speak very fluently. Um, and I would say after that probably comes Bislama, which we'll uh, talk about today. Uh, and then I speak a little bit of many different languages, um, yeah, including Nafsan and uh, Spanish, French, uh, maybe a little bit of Arabic and Russian and so on. But these are more like linguistic uh, perks to get from researching a lot of languages. Yeah, you're in the right place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I grew up, my first language was Italian. My mother was Italian. And then I speak English and I learned French. I had a bit of German when I grew up as well. And then I learned yeah, Nafsan, which is this language from Vanuatu, one of, you know, 130 languages from Vanuatu, and Bislama, and little bits of other languages, but that's that's it, really. Oh, wow. A lot of languages going around today between us. This mm, is great. Mm. I love this. Um, so I 
will admit, I had not heard of Bislama. I had not heard of Nafsan until recently. I was watching a documentary about the captains of World Cup qualifying football teams. And one of the captains they were following was the team of Vanuatu. And in this particular scene, they were standing around. I think they were getting ready to leave the hotel for a practice and they were praying. And the caption said, you know, words in Bislama. And I was like, what's Bislama? And I went into a rabbit hole just, you know, looking up like, what is it? Where do they speak it? And who are they? and everything. And then, you know, I sent out a tweet. Does anyone speak Bislama? I want to know more about this language. And <laughs> we're here to talk about it. So let us tell us. Um, one of the things I found in my rabbit hole is that Bislama has an interesting etymology. Um, can we talk about what that etymology is, where it comes from, and how did we get to this word Bislama? Well, um, uh, yeah. so Bislama comes from the word for Beshtemer, which is a sea cucumber. And Bislama is a, a Creole language, a language that developed for communication and, you know, between people who didn't speak the same languages. So people on board ships as they were coming through the Pacific, uh, uh, people who were working on plantations uh, as lab slave labor, essentially, um, had to communicate. And so this, this pidgin language developed into a Creole language, that is, it's a fully developed language. And it got the name Beshtemer because people were tra were trading the sea cucumbers. They were a very valuable commodity. So you had traders coming to Vanuatu or the New Hebrides as it was then and uh, trading for this sea cucumber. And so the language just became known as the language Beshtemer and eventually that became Bislama. So, you know, you're talking 18, early 1800s, 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s. You've got all of this movement of Europeans into this area where local people have been living for a couple of thousand years. Mm. Um, but, and you know, they all had their own languages and they could communicate probably with their neighbours and, uh, but, you know, they couldn't communicate across the whole of the country. So when Vanuatu got independence in 1980, um, the language that really unified the country was Bislama and that became the national language. Uh, and as you heard, you know, people use it in all kinds of official um, settings, um, at prayers, church, all kinds of places. That's the language, as well as, you know, the 130 other languages that Vanuatu has as well. Okay. So they were coming to Vanuatu for the sea cucumber, to trade the sea cucumber. And the word that you use, it sounds French to me. Is there, is that was there were yeah. there French speakers who were coming to trade and yeah exactly so there were there were there were French and there were English speakers in the Pacific and in fact the New Hebrides was settled both by French and English speakers and in 1906 it became what they called a condominium which is jointly run between French and the English which you can imagine was you know always going to be a success and so that 19, 1906 to 1980, you had this joint rule between the two of them. And yeah, Bechtemer is a French word, uh, but there are so many French words in Bislama. So, you know, there are three different Creole languages in the Pacific, um, sort of English-based Creole. So Solomon Islands has its own and Tokpizan in Papua New Guinea is another one. And each of them has different sources. So in, in Tokpizan, you had German settlers there, you had German colonists. And so you have German words in Tukpizan. Solomon's is much more English, um, like British English based. And then in Bislama, you've got this mix where you've got words from French, like loto for car, you know, for truck, um, uh, sora, which is ear, which mm. comes from les oreilles. Um, so all this sort of stuff that you get in, in Bislama that you don't have in those other languages. Oh, that's fascinating. Actually, I have a question about this sea cucumber because I was wondering why is it so valuable? Um, what did they do with it? Was it food or something else? Um... It, it goes, it's a Chinese delicacy, like it's used in Chinese mm -hmm. cooking. Um, so you smoke it and dry it. The so people in Vanuatu smoke and dry it. That's how they sell it so that it can tra mm -hmm. be transported. Uh, and then it's sold as dried, you know, pretty ugly looking long tubular things and then you reconstitute it by soaking it and, and chopping it up and, and uh, you find it all over the place in Chinese cooking mm. so you know there's a huge market obviously in in um, Chinese food 
interesting okay what does it yeah. taste like uh i don't think it tastes like much you know i've i have gone out of my way to try it because it's you know it's such an important thing in vanuatu but um i wouldn't i wouldn't bother you know it's sort of chewy and rubbery and yeah. a little oh. bit seafood and tasty. yeah and maybe maybe it wasn't cooked well when i had it i don't know <laughs> <laughs> give it another try <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the language. Well, we're talking about Bislama and we're talking about Nafsan specifically in this episode. And I would love to know how these languages are constructed. Um, you know, you mentioning that Bislama is a Creole language and then, you know, Nafsan and Ana, you also told me that there are many languages spoken in Vanuatu. Um, but I'd love to know how these two are constructed. Um, how are we forming sentences? Is it gendered? Is it agglutinative? Is it tonal? Um, are there any other features of the language that stand out specifically either amongst other languages in the country or in the region itself? Yeah, I mean, basically, when you talk about Creole languages, very often, and especially in the case of Bislam, I think it's very clear that it comes from English because most of the vocabulary comes from English. And so that's very apparent. So when you hear, um, for example, me means I, or talk, talk is talk. Um, but even here, we can see that very often the words um, are a little bit different. For instance, uh, here you, you reduplicate the form of the verb talk into talk, talk. Um, so you can see these kinds of things happening at the level of, let's say, how lexicon um, is created. But then when we talk just about constructing sentences, the word order is pretty much like in English. So we have first me, uh, talk, talk now, for example, I am speaking now. Um, and uh, But what I find uh, interesting is that, um, let's say, at a global scale, where we talk about what kinds of languages there are, Bislama is very often what we call synthetic, which means that um, we don't fuse different meanings um, in one word grammatically. So we would say something like, uh, for American, we could say manblo America. So man belong, belong comes from belong. And here we can see that we're using three words for something that in some languages is only one word. So I, I think that's one of the most uh, sort of interesting or fun aspects of Bislama. Yeah. And even the speakers um, say that, that they find it funny about Bislama. Just to say mm -hmm. America is three words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the. I, I'm not sure if that's the let's say the best way to say it. Uh, Nick, do you have uh, an opinion on this? Well, somebody from America. So a person from yeah. America is Manblo America. So you know yeah. that's yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So in 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 the pronouns, mm. you know, so we have gender in English, and you know, I've got all this you know current issue about what pronouns are what and whose pronouns are what, but in Bislama you don't. It's just it's just a single um, pronoun. Uh, from a gender point of view, but what they do, they have uh, an inclusive, exclusive dis distinction. So you can, when you say we, you can distinguish between we, including you, who I'm speaking to, or we, excluding you, who I'm speaking to. And lots of languages hasn't, but this is a feature of the, lang the indigenous languages of Vanuatu. So what you get in a Creole often, right, is this fusing of features of the indigenous languages. Right. And usually, I mean, often it's a mix of what comes from where, but here it's pretty clear that the grammar, most of the gram grammatical part of Bislama comes from the local languages and most of the words um, come from English and French in this case. Okay. So you get this this nice sort of mixture, yeah. Uh, no, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to say how uh, these examples of inclusive, exclusive can be also interesting to hear how it's uh, where it comes from in English. So you, me is uh, the inclusive, which means you and me. And then uh, because this includes both you and me, the person I'm talking to. Uh, and then uh, me fala is just us, let's say me and another person talking to someone else. Oh, uh, so, so you, yeah, me so, is we, me fala is, is like us compared to you guys. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then you get stuff like you, me too. So us too. And or even you, me three fala, you, us three, you know, so you can do, you know, it's quite interesting the sort of stuff that the language gets up to. Um, but, you know, there's very little morphology. So, you know, things are, 
agglutinative, I suppose, what you, you, the way you're talking about it, isolating as well. So you, you sort of put things together, but they don't, you know, it's not, it's not complex morphology with all kinds of sound changes and things like that. Um, it's pretty transparent from that point of view. Uh, but when business speakers talk, it's often really fast. So even though you think, oh, well, it comes from English, I should be able to understand it. No way. You know, you cannot. Uh, it's, it's really fast. And um, also, you know, as things get smushed together. So, you know, even though there, you might say you me too, but actually when you, when you say it, it might become you too, you know, it's really things get speeded up <laughs> when, when they talk. Yeah. So it is, it is a completely different language. And there are variations across the country too. You know, it's a big country um, and there are, you know, about 300,000 people in Vanuatu. So you get variation within the language. And also because people do bring words in from their own languages. And when you've got 130 different languages, there's a lot of scope there for really interesting new things happening in the language. So it's quite sort of dynamic as well. It's not, it's not a, you know, if you listen to something from 30 or 40 years ago, um, it'll be quite different to what people are saying now. And also new expressions come in and sort of whip through the population pretty quickly. Um, mm. So, you know, all that makes it quite an interesting sort of uh, situation that's what i was i always wonder about languages especially creole languages when um new words come into a language and i always think of technology like technological words or things like you know the internet or facebook or something like how do we express those types of words in bislama or do we just borrow them from english or Usually it's borrowed from English nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are there are all these cutesy books for tourists that try and explain Bislama to you, and they always take these ridiculous examples like, you know, piano is a, a box with black and white teeth and you hit it and it makes noises or something, but <laughs> actually people would just say piano. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that's yeah. true. There's a lot of borrowings uh, because this example I was saying for Mandu America, maybe it's again not the best because maybe people would actually say American because there's so many borrowings from English. Um, but actually, I also I remember now another example when once I was recording a story and there was a curtain in the story and then they said calico, which means cloth, calico blow window. So the cloth of the window for a curtain. And then they said, oh, but maybe people would say curtain as in English. So <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. If people are bilingual, yeah. now they're actually importing words from English once again. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Now how about Nafsan? Where does that come into play? And as you said, Nick, there are 130 languages spoken in Vanuatu. So maybe this is a broader question than I actually imagined. Um, but when we are when we have Bislama, this Creole and another language how do we see them interacting with one another and how do we find people communicating maybe choosing one or over the other or which one people choose to use in certain circumstances yeah. rather than others look it's a really interesting question it's very dynamic you know and so nafsan is a, is a language spoken in the island of ifate in central vanuatu in a few different villages there and, you know, it's got a lot of speakers for for languages of Manawatu. It's got, you know, maybe five or 6,000 speakers, which is a lot. And in the village, people in general speak Nafsan, you know, to each other. Their kids learn Nafsan, they speak Nafsan, they play in the playground and they speak Nafsan to each other. Even in the schools, um, they, they get Nafsan, you know, in, in some of the schools. So it's, and I think that's the case for a lot of the languages in the village. People speak the language. But as soon as, you know, you get somebody coming into the village, say somebody marries somebody from outside the village, they come in, they don't speak the language, then everyone will speak Bislama with them. Mm. And if you go to town, you'll speak Bislama. Um, but, you'll, you know, if you go to the market, for instance, and there are Nafsan speakers there, you'll speak Nafsan with them. You'll speak Bislama with other people. If they're Europeans that don't speak any of that, you'll speak English or French with them, you know. So it's this really amazingly dynamic situation. And you may also speak your neighbouring language. And if you meet, you know, people from there, then maybe you'll speak to them in that or, or they'll speak to you in theirs and you'll speak to them in yours, but each of you will understand each other. You know, so it's this sort of, it's a wonderful mix. Actually going to the market in Port Vila, you know, you can just hear so many languages around you. Mm. I mean, obviously I can't identify them all, but it's just, it's just fantastic. You know, there's just people from all over the place and it all works. And Bislama really is in some ways 
the linchpin that, that makes it work, right? Because everybody can communicate using that. Yeah. yeah In the... People are very often very multilingual and that's a kind of normal I, I think often for um, monolingual societies like in the west it seems strange that people would uh, speak so many languages but yeah. that's actually pretty common across yeah. the pacific i think that's yeah. so fascinating and now i wonder if at the market who gets a better deal when they speak the language <laughs> of the vendor <laughs> like i i, I, well, I yeah. always think of that like because it happens all over the world you know if you if you speak to the vendor and you know you yeah. share your language maybe you maybe you get yeah. things maybe you get a better price than, yeah. <laughs> than the other person. Yeah. well i think you're right i think there's a real benefit in learning other languages absolutely <laughs> <laughs> We should have that as um for inciting students to uh, learn yes. kind of linguistics. <laughs> you get better deals. Too, so. <laughs> so now, how how yeah. did each of you come to uh you know uh learning the languages of Vanuatu, learning the culture, learning the people? How did you develop this interest in and I guess research also? Like, how did you come to researching in this part of the world? I went there as an Australian volunteer, so like the American Peace Corps, in the mid '90s, and I lived in Port Vila for three years. So you get to, and, and I worked in a you know a local workplace and spoke Bislama with my work colleagues, and that's when I started learning Nafsan because I lived, I lived in a house on the lagoon in Port Vila, and the village Ericor village was across the lagoon, so I got people to make me a canoe. And I documented the making of the canoe and what oh, the language was for so making cool. the canoe, which was fun. And then I paddled my canoe across to the village every Wednesday morning and sat down with an old guy there and just you know learned the language and drank tea with him. And and then I went back and did my PhD research there after that. So uh, and, and then I've been going back and forward ever since. So that's you know twenty years ago, twenty five years ago. Um, but then Anna became uh, my PhD student. So, Anna, you go on from there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, so I always had, uh, so I studied linguistics and I was always very interested in languages that I don't know much about. So mm -hmm. the drive for me in focusing on, you know, uh, languages that are kind of far away and unknown to me, you know, uh, uh, was in that getting to know different kinds of grammars, different kinds of, uh, you know, systems, linguistic systems. And so I applied for a PhD position in Berlin, in Germany which was a project about Vanuatu languages. And one of the languages in the project was Nafsan because they were using mixed data uh, that he gathered before. And so we decided that my PhD project would be focusing on Nafsan. Uh, and I could also then uh, collaborate with Nick and go to Australia and we did that. And I was really, yeah, I had a really great experience uh, spending also one year in Melbourne um, as a PhD student. And I got a joint a PhD degree then from uh, the University of Berlin and uh, Melbourne. Um, and I spent, I did two fieldwork trips, uh, one in 2017 and one in 2018. And then I wrote my PhD on Nafsan and a very specific a part of Nafsan grammar, which is about uh, tense and uh, mood or yeah, basically mood is like subjunctive and that kind of stuff. So very specific topic that uh, specific. Fur furthered our knowledge of Nassau. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, we talked about constructing Bislama. Did we did did we talk about constructing Nafsan as a language? Like how you know how the grammar works and how we how we um you know construct sentences and any relation that it has to any other languages in Vanuatu. Yeah, so well, it's pretty similar to what we said about Bislama in the sense that the grammar is not very complex. Uh, the, it's somewhat between agglutinative and isolating. Uh, most the gramma the grammatical words are like particles. Um, and so for instance, if you want to say something like the present tense or something, you would first put, let's say the subject uh, pronoun, like first person like a, ah, for instance, and then you would put the marker for something like uh, let's say present progressive as in English, we would mm. say ato this, way. and then you would put the verb at the end. For instance, um, pes, uh, which means speak. So something like ato pes, I am speaking. Yeah, Nick, you can correct me if I'm saying anything wrong. But <laughs> uh, so this is just to give you an idea. And in, again, it's very similar. The word order is like in English, 
but there is a lot of stuff that's going on at the level of um, how you construct words in terms of morphology. And here, sometimes I, pre I prepared some words that are hard to pronounce for the end, and we can check them out. There's a lot of interesting vowels being lost in the middle of the word. So uh, I think that makes it sometimes hard to pronounce uh, for Westerners. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, another thing I thought about, which is a very interesting thing, is that adjectives, for instance, are often verbs. If you want to say something like, that is good, um, it's almost like if, if you made this, uh, grammatically speaking, as, as it would sound in English, it would be something like, it goods. So you can actually add things that, so something like an S that we would add to the verb, you can actually do this and put it on an adjective. So what we would call an adjective, but for them it's a verb. So that's another interesting uh, fun fact. And I just talked about a pronoun, ah, but you know, if you put that into the past tense, then the pronoun changes its form and it becomes ka. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so you have quite a complex pronoun system um, that has, you know, depending how you analyze it, but, you know, like maybe three different forms for each person, depending on the t the tense or the, you know, the mood or whatever. Um, so, you know, to even say the simplest things where you need to use a pronoun, you have to already understand something about that system. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is the, all languages have some complexity somewhere. They sort of, you can't avoid it, right? That's the nature of language. And you either mm -hmm. have a very simple grammar and then really complex semantics, or, right. you know, you have one aspect of the, of the grammatical system, which suddenly is exuberant in its, its complexity and other bits are really simple. Um, so yeah, I'd say the, the temporal system that Anna uh, explored in her PhD is one of the areas of really of, of interest and quite different to English. Um, and then the pronouns do all this strange stuff. Um, what else is it? Yeah, well, you know, and so then one of your other questions, I think, is about um, the relationship of two other languages. So, you know, this language, Nafsan, is obviously very closely related to languages around it. Um, and Efati is an island. So people have been on that island, you know, isolated from others for a period of time, although people traveled on boats lots. So let's not get too carried away with the island thing. But, you know, um, the this language nafsan has started as anna said smushing uh, words together so dropping medial vowels and then you get these con uh, complex consonant clusters which make it quite difficult for speakers of, of you know neighboring and related languages to understand because they they've still got this consonant vowel consonant vowel pattern going and suddenly you've got this other language where you've got these <laughs> you know, things happening, um, actually probably a bit more like Croatian, Anna, than... <laughs> yeah, that is true. It just so happens that the consonant clusters that we have in Croatian are not the same ones that we have in Afsan, so it's still hard for me to pronounce the ones in Afsan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, actually, yeah. I just remember that, that there is another thing. I, I didn't mention this because this my PhD was about this, but I, I didn't want to go into it because I... I researched this so much that I wasn't sure um, yeah, how to summarize the topic, but basically one of the very famous uh, famous sort of features of oceanic languages in general is the difference between realis and irrealis, which I think uh, is of interest because it's sort of a very basic category, almost like for us past and present. But what it means is really that the realis is something that either has happened or is happening. So something that is true, that is real, so to speak. And irrealis is something that is possible or it it used to be possible, but it's not anymore. So anything to do with any kind of possibility yeah, and future, uh, that would be irrealis. Uh, and I wrote my PhD about that. And so it, it is a complicated topic to, that sounds uh, to like describe a, what it is. It sounds like a yeah. conditional case. In Is it kind yes. of like, oh boy, conditionals. I personally struggle yeah. with conditionals in other languages. <laughs> Yeah, but the great thing with irrealis and realis is that you can have, you know, irrealis and realis both in the past and you can have irrealis and realis both in the future. So it isn't to do with with tense, you know, mm. it is, as Anna said, it's, it's this other thing, you know, it's about truth and it's about um, whether something's been accomplished or not, but it, it could be accomplished in the past or it could be not accomplished in the past, you know. Do you have an yeah. example of how that works? Um, the realis, yeah, so for, irrealis. For yeah, so for instance, I mean, the sentence I said before, uh, like atopes, that would be realis. So a is first person singular, realis. And if I wanted to say I will speak, I could say uh, kafo p 
Lopez. So Ka here is then first person singular Irealis. And then Fo is another future like uh, particle. Um, but then again, you could use this Ka Lopez in a neutral sentence in the case where you want to say, if I had spoken, you could again uh, use it, you could say, mm, let me see now, Afmer something, like if I had done so, Afmer would be for the <laughs> for the first part of the conditional sentence, something that didn't happen, and then Kafopes would be the possibility of what would have happened if that other thing uh, came true or something. I'm sorry, it's maybe a bit too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can use it in all sorts of possibilities like the uh, couple post for instance mm. okay so Anna what made you decide to take this very specific thing in the grammar and 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 have it be your PhD like well, what? how did you decide yeah. that <laughs> well it was the nature of the project I was in uh, in Berlin but also I was very interested in things to do with tense, aspect, and mood. Uh, so these are things like, like I mentioned, uh, present progressive or past tense or future and so on, conditional. Um, and I found that interesting because it's a, such a, such an abstract part of the grammar. It's sort of like, like you said, it's hard to even imagine oh, what is the conditional? What does this even mean? It's something that could have happened, but it didn't. And what really attracted me to this, how come that we have specific words and specific grammatical morphemes, so parts of words that tell us something so abstract. Um, it's such a hard concept uh, to understand, but still, we all speak languages where we know as our native languages, where we use conditional just like that. We know when to use it, even though when we're in school and we're learning what a conditional is, we're having trouble understanding it. So I found that very interesting. Why is this such an important part of every grammar in every language? So as you are both learning these languages and you are, uh, well, Nick, I actually want to ask you, when you went to Vanuatu and you're hanging out with the, the, the fellow who made the canoe and he's teaching you the language, like, how did, how did you learn it? Did you learn it just through communicating with people? Did you, were there any classes that you had or any resources that you were able to avail yourself of in order to learn the language? Or was it just strictly getting to know people and practicing and messing up and trying again? Yeah, yeah. No, there were no classes like this. You know, this is just what linguists do, right? This is when you do field work, you go somewhere and you impose yourself on people there. You <laughs> hope that they'll like having you around. And um, yeah, you just hang around. And so when we were doing the canoe, it was in Bislama because I hadn't learned how to speak Nafsan then. And but he would say, you know, I'd be asking you, know, what do you call this bit? What do you call that bit? And when you do that, what are you what are you doing? And can you talk a little bit about this? And I'll record it. And eventually, then I'd sit down and transcribe all these recordings. And and then I did field work. So this was this was like I said, Wednesday morning field work, which was fantastic. But then when I went back, I lived in the village for a while. And then I would just be going out and recording lots of people. I tried to record as many old people as I could, just telling whatever stories they wanted. So we just got this wonderful collection of stories, which I then, you know, produced as a book. But in going through that and transcribing it, I learned a lot. So it was really, I mean, the interactions in the village are important, but you know, going through the the sentences and you know trying to transcribe and try to you know annotate each bit mm -hmm. of the sentence and find out what it does that's when you really get to learn the grammar um so really i i did that field work i came back and i spent i suppose a year transcribing all that stuff and when i went back i was speaking language better than i was when i left the village you know the year before because i'd spent all this time immersed in the texts um, so the, yeah there are no classes uh, this is what linguists do. You go out and do field work. You ask questions. Um, you make a pain of yourself. But, you know, fortunately, people are, um, in my case, they were very welcoming. And, and uh, I think they got what I was doing. They, you know, often the older people especially got the idea of talking to the future through me. You know, so they, mm. they understood that I was making recordings that, that would be there for a long time. Um, and they understood the language was changing. Languages always change. But, you know, old people always decry the change in the language <laughs> and so they were they were quite keen to to record the language as it should have been spoken the proper way and then mm -hmm. um, make that available for the for young people into the future 
That seems to be the universal thing that uh, because we often think, oh, it's just because we go to school and in school they tell us how to speak. But actually, even in other communities where the language is not necessarily written down, people still have these opinions about what is the right way to speak. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And it makes me wonder, you know, as you're talking to generations, like how have you noticed the language change from that older generation to uh, maybe what you recorded and maybe what you've heard, the stories they told you, to what you're hearing now and what you're seeing now. Have you noticed those changes over the past 20 years? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the recordings that Anna made and her colleague Rosie, who were there, were there at the same time, um, there are, there are, I think people talk more quickly. And also that vowel reduction is increasing. So you're getting it in more situations. And then also, if you look back, because I've got missionary materials from the uh, late eighteen hundreds, it's there are lots more vowels. So you know you can just see this slow attrition, and language is getting more and more um, consonant clusters, and and so so you know, and also that means you talk more quickly because you've got fewer syllables um, because you know you've, you've dropped those vowels. So I'd say that was a, a major thing. Yeah, well, in comparison to next data, I found especially regarding my PhD topic, which was this realis, realis, and these pronouns, we did find uh, some differences in, um, I can't quite remember right now uh, what they were, but it had to do something with conditional clauses, I think, that we just mentioned. So we found some differences, I think, in the how often certain constructions were used. Some older people preferred one type and the younger people preferred the other. And yeah, that was interesting because that would be quite a fast change um, to happen for something so fundamental as like tense or pronoun system. So hmm. yeah, it's, it's something interesting to follow up and see how it develops. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think also, you know, as with the linguistic diversity that, you know, we obviously have in Vanuatu, I think that I'd, I'd be curious to know generations down, like how the languages mold and shift or you know meld into one another or if any of them god forbid hopefully not you know end up endangered because of you know lack of usage or people you know older speakers you know passing away um do you notice anything like that amongst any of the languages like maybe that usage just falling to the wayside and maybe people preferring to use one over the other or any any shifts have there been any shifts like that yeah especially as people move into bigger towns and there are there are a couple of bigger towns so in port vila in particular um that's when you you risk losing language because you're just using bislama much more People, I mean, when they come into town, they may often live in small uh, communities in the city of their own language people. So, you know, they're, they're still with language speakers in the city. So that's that's potentially, you know, a factor to maintain the language. But, you know, there's a risk also with climate change. Not all of Vanuatu is at risk from climate change. A lot of the country is uplift and mountainous, so okay. that's okay. But there are coastal communities, there are lower-lying um, communities, and if people have to move away from their community into bigger groupings of, you know, like um, towns or villages or whatever, then that's a, that's a potential risk point for language as well, right? Because you're mixing with speakers of other languages, um, all kinds of factors come in about which language is used more often. So these are these are factors. And some of these languages only have very few speakers. So I, I mentioned that Nafsan has five or 6,000. That's a big language in Vanuatu. Uh, there are languages with a few hundred speakers. Oh. So there are, you know, there's always a risk but so few speakers that, and now what's happening is a lot of people from Vanuatu are coming to Australia to work. There's a scheme, which in some senses is very good because they come and make a lot of money working on, um, you know, fruit picking and things like that in Australia. But it means that a lot of young people are leaving the community and you're ending up with communities in which you've only got very young people and very old people and all the middle populations gone off to work. And so obviously that's going to have implications of uh, we, we don't really understand yet. I think what what that potentially could do um, for all kinds of social um, impacts, but one of them could be language as well. Hmm. And I think in the case of Nafsan, the proximity to the city is definitely, let's say, an endangerment point uh, because a lot of people um, spend more time maybe speaking Bislama if they work in the city or if they move to the city because 
it's closer to work and so on. Uh, so we have seen some families that originally are enough sons would be enough sun speakers, but they actually use a lot of Islam more than other families. And so that's a potential risk point as well. Mm. Mm. And another thing is that Vanuatu is a very, this has been historically maybe an issue, but uh, uh, it's very prone to natural disasters. So you have things like volcanic eruptions and things like that. And for those reasons, people also move quite a lot. Um, and then they are displaced from their place of origin. And maybe, again, there's a risk of losing the language. Where are they going? Do they, Are they leaving Vanuatu or are they moving to other uh, well, parts of the country not the, so the, you, you have volcanoes on specific islands and if there is an eruption of that on that island then they would move to another island simply and they try to come back if the things get better but sometimes not everyone comes back and i think this has been a problem in one of the islands hmm. uh, those that have volcanoes not all of them do so yeah oh wow Anna, I wanted to ask you um what was your journey like with learning the language um was it Mm -hmm. similar to Nick's in the way of just learning through field work or did you have any resources or anything that you were able to avail yourself of to learn the languages yeah well I had like a year um I was a year into my PhD when I did my first field trip and so I had the like almost a year, year and a half uh I had this year and a half where I was supposedly preparing myself but it was very hard because uh okay I had Nick's data and the grammar that he wrote about Nafsan and I was trying to get as much possible out of it as I could uh, in recordings, uh, but it's not easy when you're just kind of consuming passively uh, the data. And Bislama also, there are some books, but again, it's a very different story when you have to speak it. So I was, again, trying to learn it in this very ac academic way, but then I think I really just learned more in one day <laughs> when I was in Vanuatu than all that time that I was like reading the books and stuff. So actually, Bislama was a very sort of gradual process of uh, switching from English to Bislama. I would be using, trying to use as many Bislama words and constructions that I knew, but I was kind of sneaking in English. I was uh, plugging in English words where I didn't know how to say it in Bislama. And this kind of worked because a lot of people speak English. So they think, oh, okay, this is, maybe they think this is actually my version of English. I don't know. But eventually I kind <laughs> of eased into Bislama with this uh, tactics. So that worked. <laughs> and Nafsan, I have to say, I never fully started really speaking it to people. I would always kind of default to Bislama because I was always unsure about uh, certain words, but I can understand quite a lot. And here and there, I would sneak in a few sentences. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I kind of stayed maybe in that academic mindset towards Nafsan. So I didn't start speaking it like Nick does. Um, but I, I can understand quite a lot. And especially when they talk about me, I'm like, you can do that anymore. <laughs> I see what you're doing. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Have we ever experienced the time in Vanuatu of language um, suppression um, where maybe English or French were, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Were um, encouraged and... Islam, Nafsan, and other local yeah. languages were discouraged, yeah. maybe, you know, punitively. Um, yeah. Has, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was the norm, um, probably all the way through the colonial time, uh, where, you know, the emphasis was you have to learn English and French. And uh, I, I have a... a I went to a school in Tana, which is a southern one of the southern islands, and I found a placard which says "Je ne dois parler uh, langage," mm. and it was a placard that was put around somebody's neck, and they were they were made to stand probably stand in the corner or something like a dunce's cap. So, you oh, know, God. so it was absolutely prohibited um, to speak language. And Bislama, I, I expect for a starter, they didn't even consider it to be a language. They just would have considered it to be some, you know, rubbish that people spoke. So it was very colonial. It was very English and French. That's it. Um, until probably the 70s and they became, you know, people took up Bislama as, because there was this sort of rise of nationalism uh, and the movement towards independence. And then people were recognising Bislama as, as one of the unifying 
um, languages of the country and 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 valuing it. Uh, and then, so even in the education system post independence, there's still an ambivalence towards Bislama, and it's really you know sometimes you'll get them saying yes we should be teaching kids in Bislama, other times they should be they say no no education is in English and French and they can learn Bislama outside. So it's very tricky because there isn't then a standardised way of writing Bislama because nobody learns to write it at school. And so you get all this variation in the writing as well, as well as in the speaking, but mm -hmm. also in the writing. So, um, and, you know, on Facebook and all kinds of things, you get all kinds of spellings and, you know, it's quite, it's sort of exciting. It's sort of the way I suppose English was also in the early days before things settled down, you know, and so it might take a hundred years or so before there is a, a unified agreed spelling. So, you know, there is a Bible in Bislama, and it's got a unified spelling. And so there are these things, but it, that doesn't mean that people use them. You know, they'll, they'll read them, but it doesn't mean when they come to write the language, they necessarily write in that, that way as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, there was this suppression. Um, nowadays, also with language, with speaking your own language, there are some bilingual schools where using the language, local language is encouraged. Um, but not so many. And that requires there to be resources like a dictionary and some storybooks and other things for literacy in the language. And that's not always the case, you know. So th that's something that linguists can help with. You know, we've done that in, in Ericor and people can use those materials. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really, you know, it's an ongoing story. And it changes also when you get a different government, sometimes they'll just come in and say, no, 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 we're not going to do this anymore. And so, mm. you, you know, you can't run bilingual programs in that way. You know, you've got to have consistency. So you've got kids, you know, starting school where they're getting the vernacular in the, in the school and then they're doing transitions to learning French or English as well. Um, but if that gets interrupted and suddenly you're, all you're doing is learning French and English, then there's no real way of knowing what the benefit of the, of the bilingual program was because it was never a pure bilingual bilingual program and also it's a tiny country it's really hard to find lots of teachers you know it's there's there's lots there's lots um militating against um you know good language programs you know mm. because the, you just try running a country with three hundred thousand people you've got to have the whole public service all the teachers you know police force everything judiciary it's it's not that easy yeah, yeah. the language of instruction is english and french yeah, so you have you have schools again. You've got this legacy of the of the colonial past where you have both French and English schools. They recently set up a French university in a tiny country like this. They've got a, a the University of the South Pacific, which is Anglo Anglophone, and now they've got a French university as well. So the the Francophone part is still very strong, and you know it, it, it's a very political background. The French were Catholic, the English were Protestant. And so you've just got this thing that goes right through the society, you know, and Francophones are still very strong um, and, and sort of still cling to that um, Francophonic, you know, mm. quite legitimately, that's their background. So, you know, it, it's it's great in a lot of ways for the society. We have, you know, you get Frank, great French bakeries in Port Vila, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is, you know, probably the best and, bread in the Pacific. <laughs> and restaurants, yeah, French restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> interesting yeah. wow so we're talking about since the 1970s we were experiencing this oppression of language in Vanuatu so this is 50 and change years do you know how people were able to retain the language in the first place if they weren't allowed to express themselves and you know for risk of punishment like how did they hold on to traditions how did they hold on to the language and you know where where yeah. were the safe places where they were allowed to be themselves and be a community look most places were safe places you know the school was really marginal to the community um and you know kids could go there and probably not not suffer a huge amount i mean obviously there was some prestige factor in the, the way the language was perceived but most people's lives do not rely on the government in Vanuatu. Most people have gardens that they grow their own food in. And, you know, they're, they're sort of self-sufficient to a large extent. And they'll do some cash cropping to make some money because they might have to pay school fees or they might have to buy, you know, store goods. But in general, um, and certainly the further you get from Port Vila, the more true this is, that people just are self-sufficient. So, you know, they've created, well, they have safe places because, 
the government doesn't have the reach. And like I was saying, it's such a small population. There is just isn't the capacity on the government to do anything, which the good side of that is this, right, that people are sort of self-sufficient. The bad side is that they don't get a lot of the um, services that they should, you know, like good health services, good policing and all that kind of thing doesn't really happen um, once you get out into the rural areas. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that the perception of school is also different from what we might imagine. For us, school is sort of the pillar of everything and you continue your education. But I think a lot of people in Vanuatu just don't have that many years of schooling. It depends where, but in rural areas, I would say they don't have that many years of schooling. And because most important or let's say the most useful tasks you can learn are usually outside of school. Hmm. Uh, like people learn how to build a house how to uh, grow your garden how to cook and that kind of stuff and it's not as important as it is I think it's not so central as it is in our lives um, right right I and... think I like that <laughs> I wish I learned to, <laughs> yeah. to practical skills in school like I don't care about the radius of a circle but <laughs> I need I mean I, <laughs> but it you know I would like to know how to grow my own vegetables and be sufficient yeah. on my own. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> since we are talking about lifestyle and what is what people do in Vanuatu, um, Nick, you talked about a canoe and Anna, you mentioned bread. So I'm ready to learn about culture. What do we do in Vanuatu? How do we get around? What do we wear? What do we eat? What do we cook? I want to yeah. know everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, yeah. the the sort of the staple foods are things you grow in your garden. Although nowadays people have store goods and, they, you know, tinned fish and rice is a, is a big additional. Yeah. But the traditional stuff was, was root crops, um, taro, sweet potato, yams, um, and then, you know, bananas, coconuts, um, greens that you grow in the garden, that kind of thing. And then bush foods, you know, things that, that are just out there in the jungle that you can go and, and pick. And, you know, you know, people know an awful lot about uses of plants. And there aren't so many animals um, there, you know, so you, you um, birds and flying foxes and stuff like that. And fish, obviously, lots of fish. So they're the things that, that you would typically be eating. And still today, that's a big part of people's diet. Um, uh, if you can go fishing, then that's great. And you bring, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the root crops, the the national dish of Vanuatu is called lap lap. And it's a root crop that's, um, you take a root and it depends, it can be different ones, but whatever you do, you pound it up um, and make it into a paste and mix it with coconut milk. And you lay it over leaves, so big um, leaves like banana leaves or something like that. In, and it's quite big, so it might be a meter across. And wow. and then you can put um, meat on top of it if you like, or banana or whatever. And then you wrap that up and you put it into an earth oven, which is you know rocks that you've heated up before, um, very hot. And then you put all this in the ground. You put the rocks on top of it, and you cover that with more leaves, and you cover it with soil, and then it just cooks in the ground. So mm -hmm. that's the sort of you know, the, the major thing. And you can do that with bits of vegetables. You can do that. You know, there's all kinds of variations, but that's that's the national dish. And if you go to the markets in Port Vila, you can buy pieces of lap lap. Um, it's, it's, you know. Uh, what does it taste like? It's really, well, it's, it's a, so the texture is, well, it depends on what's in it, but um, it's a bit sort of um, chewy. And um, some people don't like, like it at all. Maybe a bit yeah. like fudge. Like texture. fudge. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, but savory and um, yeah, and then you get the meat on top, and you get the juices of the meat, and then afterwards you might drizzle some more coconut milk over it. So it's full of coconut milk. So if you've got cholesterol, you know, forget it. You know, that's just forget. not for you. <laughs> it's not <my> diet <laughs> food. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would say it tastes mostly. And... Yeah, it tastes a lot like coconut. I would say that's yeah. the best way to describe it. And then, uh, depending on the root you chose, taro, yam, or cassava then it tastes a little bit like that a bit more, but it's a very concentrated yeah. coconut flavor, mm, which I don't yeah. think I've tasted in any other um, dishes like that. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, for special occasions, they'll kill a pig and roast the pig in the same way in the earth oven. Um, and that's, you know, for you know, special occasions, not done all the time. 
Um, but you could put other, you will put chicken in there or you put beef in there or whatever you happen to have, you'll put into the lap lap as well. So that's the sort of the main dish. But everyday food um, nowadays tends to be rice and mm. tinned fish, which means you have to have cash to be able to buy that stuff. Oh. Um, yeah. So that's a whole different thing, right? So that's somebody has to have a store in the local community and say so then you have a cash economy and you have to think think about how you're going to get cash so the way that people got cash in the past was copra and copra is um the the flesh of the coconut that's smoked and dried and that was quite popular and you know it was sold overseas and people would use copra in um as a fat in you know cooking but it's not so popular now so that's no longer really available so people grow things like there's coffee there's cacao for chocolate there's vanilla um, you know, there are all kinds of cash crops that people have got into uh, uh, more recently. And it's sort of quite nice because they can work it intensively for a little while just to make the money and then they, they can go back to doing whatever they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's not like they have to be working in there eight hours a day every day or anything like that. Yeah. 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 The life is a lot slower, I would think, to, in, to describe like how it feels, the lifestyle, I would say that the relationship to life is also different. Uh, not just that it's slower that you can be late or something, but even just the fact that people don't look at work like we do. It's not something that I have to find this job and this career defines me. No, if you need money, you do something, you get the money, and then you don't have to work for a while, maybe, if someone in your family uh, yeah, works or whatever. So it's a very different approach. And I, I like it a lot. I think it's very, it's more human. Yes. It kind of gives you time to decide what you want to do, how you want to do it. And the real obligations only really start maybe when you have children. But even then, you get a lot of help from the community, from the extended family. So it's a very community-based kind mm. of life. And um it's not so individualistic like um, for us. I want to take a step back because I remember the question that I wanted to ask you before. And it was about, um, you know, uh, this Lama not being, uh, you know, always being written differently and not having that standardization. And it makes me really curious to know about oral tradition. Um, do we have an oral tradition in Vanuatu of maybe storytelling or legend myth um anything like that yeah absolutely yeah and you know i think most uh pre-industrial societies if you want to call them that that's that's what people do you know what do you do in the evening you sit around and talk um and you know you you eat and you sit around a fire and you talk and there are a whole lot of stories um that Everybody knows. So when I went out and recorded stories with a whole lot of people, sometimes I'd be recording the same story because it's part of mm. canon. You know, that's the canon of the lo- of the of the village. The people all know the story of you know um, the so the seashell that got turned over and the sea and all the seafood was underneath it. And then the kid watched the woman doing this, and then he tried doing it. But when he did it, the seawater just cut, started flooding through. And I don't know if you know the story of Strega Nonna. There's this Italian story where, you know, there's a magic pot with, which you can get spaghetti from whenever you want. And somebody sees it, they go and get the spaghetti from it. They don't know how to turn it off and it covers the whole village with spaghetti. Well, this is the same story, right, where you go and there's this seafood and you think you're going to get this free seafood and you turn the thing, but you don't know how to turn it off and it floods the village with water. So, you know, it's amazing, isn't it? You've got exactly the same story, cautionary tale to kids, to just do as they're told (laughs) so there are these kinds of stories and there you know everybody in the village knows those stories the kids have versions i recorded the kids telling versions of the same stories so yes absolutely there is this oral tradition um and then there are particular stories and there's also um string band music so that's another thing in vanuatu is people play this music which is this sort of you know has a, a tea uh, tea case bass you know and uh, all kinds of Im- improvised instruments and maybe guitars and ukuleles and stuff and that's quite popular and and there are songs there that are also passed down from generation to generation oh. and then people will create new ones as well but there is this sort of you know so there is an oral tradition of, of stories and of passing these songs to each other and all this kind of stuff yep are there stories of myth and legend of gods and and um, yes, sort of. so 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. Devils are absolutely rife. Like the whole place is full of devils. Uh, you know, every 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 banyan tree has a devil in it, and and there are local um, spirits. So it's very, you know, even though Christianity is so successful, everybody absolutely still knows where all the devils are. And mm. you, if something happens, often you'll have to make an offering to the local. Um, you know, God or whatever, um, to put it right. So even though you can pray to Jesus all you want, um, you still have to, to cover your bases, um, go and, <laughs> and do these other rites as well. Stories of how islands were formed, you know, so the turtle, um, the turtle, and what was it? Actually, it was another one where there was a flood that couldn't be stopped, and they had to, she. So the woman had to put up a, a, a wall of sand, and the water still kept coming through. So it split the island in two. So that's how the island became to be in two. So you know, you get those kinds of um, foundation stories as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we should also mention the concept of custom. So custom as in English, but uh, it's a Vanuatu term uh, for or Bislava term. Uh, for all the traditions, like, for example, the beliefs that we just mentioned um, and uh, all the tradition that that is sort of predates, let's say, the col colonialist times mm -hmm. uh, is called the custom. And that's a very important concept. It actually also has a legal implication for certain aspects like land ownership, which is now based on the custom law of um, whose ancestors were in which land and things oh, like that. So okay. they actually give a lot of importance to this tradition. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. When I each of you have been in Vanuatu, what are some things that you've enjoyed doing and experiencing? Well, everything, I guess. I don't know. It's a, <laughs> well, it's a tropical country. So I think for me, when I first went to there, uh, what I really loved was the availability of all the tropical fruits. Mm. And uh, I loved eating the mangoes, the soursop, the, I don't know, uh, pompadour, all these things. I was like, uh, for, for like, I think for like two weeks, I was just eating fruit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I love that. But also really just, yeah, kind of relaxing. Yeah, taking that slower pace a little bit and hanging out with people. Yeah. Yeah, and me too. I think the food is really is is great, you know. I love, I love going to the market. You know, that's, that's wonderful. But hanging out in the village or in the main street and just seeing people you know because it's such a small community mm. that you will see people you know and that's really nice, you know, that you don't have to go to a huge effort to go and visit people. I mean, you do that, but you can also just bump into people um in a way that, you know, here in Melbourne uh, there are, you know, three million people or something. I very rarely see anybody I know anywhere. <laughs> it's just it's almost impossible. You know? um, so that, yeah. I like that. It's a very powerful thing, like being a foreigner and in a span of like one month, uh, you're already kind of you feel a bit like a local that that oh. hasn't happened to be uh, anywhere else uh, <laughs> other than there where I was like okay now I know so many people in Puerto Vila and <laughs> I've been here for a month. So, yeah. <laughs> oh that's so sweet I never yeah. run I never run into anyone I know I mean <laughs> and I'm like you and I'm, you know in Melbourne like I'm in New York City like I never run yeah. into anyone I know so it must be so nice to have that in yeah. such a short time yeah. and you've you've gotten to know so many people there um yeah. when you return which I know you both will at some point what are you looking forward to doing in Vanuatu Catching up with um, people I know, yeah, um, just, yeah. I did go, I went last year, so after COVID, so, to, you know, obviously with COVID there was nothing happening. I think Manoratu was closed off. Um, but I went last year and that was really nice. And also I'd written a dictionary of the language, so I wanted to take that back to the village. Uh, so that was, you know, very nice to be able to take something back. So, yeah, just going back and seeing people and, you know, like I've been going there now like I said, it's 25 years. And so there, there are lots of, lots of connections and um, history and, you know, it's just, it's part of my life now. So I, yeah. I really like going back there. Yeah. 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 For me, it's the same. I think catching up with people. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to do exactly field work. I changed a little bit now uh, my areas of expertise, uh, but uh, if I go next time, I think maybe it will be more for vacation. Uh, I'm not sure. Might be, uh, but yeah, I definitely really like sort of privately catching up with friends and uh, I made some really good friends there that also helped me a lot um, yeah. to, to do my research and everything. So 
yeah, it's a very personal place for me. Not not just it's not just an academic thing, but it's really more than that. So is that there great, yeah. is there a lot of uh, tourism infrastructure there, or is tourism a big a big um, industry in Vanuatu? Yeah, yeah oh, absolutely. Okay. It's they're really dependent on on uh, tourism, but you know they've they really suffered during COVID. And now they're suffering because so many young people are going away on these um, to do this work in Australia. They don't have enough staff, and so their reputation oh, no. as a tourist destination is really suffering. And they don't, you know, they haven't been able to maintain the hotels, so they're not very, you know, fancy anymore. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the staff, so that all makes it very tricky. And yeah, so it is a tourist destination. It would love more tourists to go there, and they can sell. Well, you know, part of their angle is you know volcanoes. Uh, adventure tourism so you can go on walks and kayak tours and uh, you know over these lagoons and all that kind of stuff it is it does have a lot to attract tourists but it's not you know it's not like fiji or bali which are quite cheap mm. and which is not particularly cheap oh. so that's a problem for it um, but yeah you know if you want to try really interesting new foods and and you know experience all of this wonderful mix of of different local cultures and beautiful environments um, it's it's got a lot going for it you think the Vanuatu Tourism Board will sponsor this episode? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, um, we South Pacific. You know the um, the musical South Pacific, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was set basically in Vanuatu. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh. So there were a quarter of a million American troops in the New Hebrides during the war. It was one of the major bases, and there's still huge amounts of memory of people you know there are interesting oral histories if, of that of the second world war and the presence and you know one of the interesting things was the presence of black american soldiers and that they were treated equally mm. from the perspective of the new hebrides uh which the the local blacks were not treated equally right they were really treated as as you know yeah. slight well second class citizens uh, so that, that in some ways it was a bit um, of a liberation or a, or a eye-opening experience for the local people to see that Americans treated everybody the same. I mean, you know, you and me w might not agree with that, but it was ostensibly what what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there was this whole uh, and and the history of that. There are bits of American stuff that you know they still sell Coke bottles in Efate at the roadside markets mm -hmm. that they keep finding washing up on the beaches and all this sort of stuff. So you know, it's it's quite a it was quite a um, interesting. <laughs> time for new hebrides <laughs> oh interesting oh wow yeah. i haven't seen south pacific in many years it's time to read well, that music well that's right when you see it next time just keep in mind that it's, it's actually mostly i mean it's sort of a bit of a pastiche of different things yeah, but mostly yeah. It's in new hebrides, yeah uh -huh. well anna and nick i've really enjoyed learning from you both in this uh conversation and i would love for you to let our listeners know um what you're working on now and where we can find you if we want to get in touch okay um, uh, i'm at yeah. university of melbourne uh, i'm working at the moment uh i'm doing some work on bislama actually with uh, a team we're, we're trying to record language survival kits so that when humanitarian workers go in, they can uh, know how to communicate in Bislama. So that's, that's one of my projects. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, you can also Google Nick's name. Uh, if you have a website, right. I was going to say that I, I also have a website. You can Google me if you want to contact me and you'll find that information easily. And I think it's the same for Nick. Uh, and for me, I actually now I, had a slight change in direction in my academic research. Um, I kind of, I got a new position where um, in the Netherlands at the University of Tilburg, where I'm going to be researching comics uh, with linguistics methods. Uh, so that's uh, quite, quite of a change, but uh, I kind of felt like doing something different and I really <laughs> like comics. So it's basically, yeah, studying like universal, sort of universal principles of communication uh in comics and how they have a visual language Whoa. not just uh not just random uh it's, it's like there are rules that actually conform to linguistic rules so i'm excited about that but uh like i still have a lot of stuff about enough sun uh in the pipeline of the academic publishing so i'm still writing about it uh amazing so still happening. Yeah. oh that's so cool i'm sure a lot of people would love to learn about comics through linguistics or linguistics through comics as well because 
everybody loves comics. So that's exciting. And congratulations yeah. on your new position. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I will add um, some links to your websites in the show notes for this episode so that people who are listening uh, can get in touch with you very quickly, very easily, uh, just by clicking the link. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Thanks, so. <laughs> and yeah. uh <laughs> I like to end each episode on the same question, just to have a little bit of fun before we say goodbye. Do you have any jokes, popular sayings, tongue twisters, cool slang words, idioms, words of wisdom, or words of advice in Bislama or in Nafsan to share and to teach us? Okay, so... so uh, I Oh, sorry, maybe yeah, you on. have something better. I just found some words that are hard to pronounce, but I don't have any jokes. So, if, okay. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. If you have something funnier, we should end on the funnier one, I suppose. <laughs> okay, well, you, you go first. Okay, so I found these that I, at least are hard to pronounce for me. Um, One is, uh, Ad, it means Adam's apple, and it's, okay, um, button cuffing. <laughs> button cuffing. <laughs> button cuffing. Um, Pat nit patten kafik. Patten kafik, yeah. Mm patten kafik. Yeah. Okay, maybe it's not that hard actually. Yeah. Yeah. And the other <laughs> one was um trust. Nasra lesokwen. Nasra lesokwen. Nasra lesokwen. Quinn, Nasra Sokwin, Nasra Sokwin. Nasra, Nasla, oh boy, Nasra, this is Nasra, 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 Le Sokwin, Nasra, Nas, I'm not rolling the R, Nasra, Res Sokwin, yeah. Sokwin. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's hard because you have a r and then you have a l and yeah, <laughs> that's tough. It's tough for me. Yeah. Um, I want my listeners to try that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted yeah, to I have a couple of words of um Bislama, which is sort of fun because, like I say, it's uh, it's sort of creative. So there's a vine that's called Mile Minute because it grows very quickly. You know, mile, so that's mile the kind minute. Of thing. Oh, okay. mile a minute yeah mile, so it a minute. A mile a minute yeah you know or one day it's also called one day because in one day it'll grow you know huge wow. amounts so that yeah. kind of stuff and there's an interesting expression so when someone's excited they say fire light fire light that is his fires lit up or if he's defeated in an argument then you say fire dead you know he's his fires <laughs> out so it's that kind of it's really you know lovely little expressions like that and we, if you hear that these they're mm. idiomatic right and you have no real way of knowing what they mean unless someone explains it to you so yeah it's fun yeah, yeah and i can also advertise on facebook there's a group called uh, funny side blob islama i think okay. that's the name uh yeah funny side blob islama language um and there people put jokes in Bislama. and <laughs> i have to say i often don't understand them because this is the slang and this kind of stuff but uh yeah and i think a lot of people a lot of nivans so people from vanuatu think that Bislama is a funny language mm. because it has this connection to english so there's something funny about it so. Well, thank you so much for sharing those and giving me an opportunity to try some words in Bislama. It's I always like to try and I think it's, you know, it's part of every language process and learning process, as you both well know. Um, and I appreciate both you very much. I appreciate your time and your uh, your research and everything that you do. So thank you for coming and talking with me today. Um, I'd like to just really quickly before we say goodbye um let's say we're in vanuatu and you're with your friends and you are about to go your separate ways uh in bislama or nafsan what is the best way to say goodbye well so in nafsan you mm -hmm. could say something like uh tete mal which means sometime tete mal and you know that's a, that's a way of doing it um and also just so Ale, which actually comes from French, ale, ale nda, and nda is just one of those expressions that you can use for 
sort of that's it you know it's a, it's a it, it has many it basically can mean what you want when, <laughs> when you say it but um but that you can say alinda um or tetemal or um you know yeah so i would say something like that and in bislama you could say ale tata so tata like bye bye oh, <laughs> ale tata. i love that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great Nick you saved me because I completely forgot <laughs> what's the best <laughs> well, Anna and Nick Ale Tata thank you thank you very much you. again for this conversation and I will right. be talking to you yeah. soon bye right. okay. thank you for bye. having us bye, bye.